Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the final week of Romania Rocks, which started so brilliantly last night with Elif Shafak meeting Matei Vishniak. If you have not seen their conversation, I urge you to catch up with it on our Facebook page and YouTube channel. It is so worthwhile of your time. And while you are there, check out our other rock talks, Norman Mana and Ben Okri, Andrei Codrescu and David Mitchell, Marius Kivu and Paul Bailey, Anna Blandiana and Fiona Samson, Bogdan Teodorescu and Ian Rankin, Magda Kurnece and Deborah Levy, Ioana Pârvulescu and A.L. Kennedy, and tomorrow, Philip Perm will meet Sean Cotter. We've had some great moments so far with our first Romanian-British Literature Festival, brought to you with the support of the European Literature Network. So let's keep on rocking. My name is Magda Stroie. I'm the acting director of the Romanian Cultural Institute in London. And today I invite you to watch a live discussion bringing together seven Romanian writers currently living in the UK. Last week, we met two British writers who had made Romania their home. And I'm delighted for us to be once again joined by viewers on the social media platforms of the British Council Romania, Romanian Embassy in the UK and the British Embassy in Bucharest, organizations with whom we have partnered up throughout the year to celebrate 140 years of British-Romanian diplomatic relationships. Being diplomatic is not something any of the seven writers you will be meeting shortly has ever been accused of. And in charge of producing a spectacular fireworks display for our belated bonfire night, is Paula Erizano. Paula is the culture editor of the Calvert Journal. She's written on arts and culture for The Guardian, CNN, Dazed, Chatham House, The Architectural Review, and other publications. She has been shortlisted for the Words by Women Award as UK's Culture Journalist, Journalist of the Year 2019. She published a book on the 2009 protests in Moldova this is my first revolution, steal it, and the poetry collection, take care. Have a great evening, ladies and gentlemen. Paula Erizanu, over to you. Thank you, Magda. Hi, everyone. It is my pleasure today um, to introduce today's guests. Um, I will try to be brief, but um, we are quite a lot of uh, women writers here. Um, so Stella Branzano, Stella, could you wave, please? Um, yes. Uh, is a Moldovan British writer and poet. Her prose explores issues of identity, belonging, uh, women's emancipation, and women's rights. Um, she has published um, a, a novel called Bessarabian Nights, which um, uh, deals with a, a difficult uh, topic, and that's um, human trafficking um, and sex trafficking, but today she will um, read us some extracts from her new novel, which I'm looking forward to. Vika Demic, Vika, can you wave please? Um, is a London-based um, poet, songwriter, and author of uh, four books of poetry and short stories. Um, she writes music and has authored uh, the song, A Century of Love, which represented um, the Republic of Moldova at the Eurovi Eurovision International uh, Song Context, uh, Contest in 2008. She's also written the lyrics for um, Yojan Doga's Walls and um, um, and is a UCL graduate in international relations and works in diplomacy. I don't know how she manages to do it all. Uh, Ioana Morpurgo, um, can you wave, uh, Ioana? Um, Ioana studied literature and cultural anthropology. Um, she has researched the culture of transition in post-communist societies at Exeter University in the UK. She's written three novels. Um, as well as articles, essays, and, and short stories. Um, and in 2016, following the Brexit referendum in the UK, she organized a series of lectures and public debates on uh, what unites us um, in, in Europe. 
Uh, she's also an activist of human rights and the environment. Um, and um, what is interesting to me is that she's also a member of the Green Party in the UK. So I, I will ask her something about that um, a bit later. Uh, Christina Murashan, Christina, can you wave? Um, is a poet, blogger, and book reviewer. She moved to the UK in 2015, um, where she published her debut volume, um, Angel Dust. And since then, she's published um, poetry in anthologies in the UK um, and um, um, also in Romania and Mexico. Simona Nastak, Simona, can you wave? Is an art curator, critic, and poet. She studied art history and theory in Bucharest and holds an MA in creative curating from Goldsmiths University. She has curated um, exhibitions and live poetry events in London, uh, Seoul, uh, New York, um, Berlin, Brussels, pra uh, Prague, and so on, uh, featuring artists such as Anish Kapoor, um, Yap Blanc, and Dan, uh, Dan Perzhovsky, among others. Uh, in 2017, she published um, um, her volume of poetry, The Depressing Color of um, Honey, which won an important award um, in, in Romania. Um, and she's performed at various festivals across the world. Andrea Yulia Scridon. Um, Andrea, can you uh, wave? Is a Romanian-American writer and translator. She was born in Romania, but she emigrated with her parents in the, uh, to the United States as a child and grew up in Florida. She studied comparative literature at King's College London and creative writing um, at the University of Oxford. She um, is assistant editor at Asymptote Journal, a fiction editor at the Oxford Review of Books. Um, and um, she um, has published um, uh, work in World Literature Today, Oxford Poetry, Asymptote Journal, and um, um, and has also written a novel set in the 18th in 18th century Romania and a book of poems inspired by um, George Enescu's compositions. And uh, finally, Anda Vachnavan. Anda, can you wave? Whose birthday it is today? Um, so, um, a happy birthday to you, and thank you so much for joining us on this special day. Um, and I was born in Chisinau in Moldova. Um, she later graduated uh, from Babes Bolyai University in Romania, specializing in journalism. Um, and um, uh, she ran a business in Cluj Napoca in Romania for 12 years and has migrated to um, London in 2017, where she started a literary blog. Um, so without further ado, um, we will start with um, an open discussion where I will ask um, two uh, questions to um, the floor and um, everyone is welcome to, uh, to contribute. And then uh, we will move towards um, more personalized um, uh, questions and um, readings um, from um, our guests' um, works. Um, so my first question, is um, what do you feel you have gained and what do you feel you have lost by moving to the UK? Right, so what have I lost? I think one of the things that I miss most since I moved to the UK uh, in 2000 is my mother's food. Um, and that is something that I often think, and even though I have uh, mastered a few recipes, um, they're not quite how she cooks them. So that's, that's the thing that I miss most. What have I won? I would say that it's probably the fact that I can be who I am in this vast city. I love, I love the anonymity of London and the freedom that it, um, it gives you and it gave me. So um, these are my two answers. Amazing. I mean, um, you know, with decades of work, I'm sure we can all um, reach the levels of cooking of our mothers or grandmothers. I hope um, so. <laughs> you wanna, do you want to go next? Um, maybe. I'm not sure how coherent my, uh, my answer is, but I'll do my best. Um, I think probably what I gained um, being away from Romania is the experience um, of having a perspective without being daily involved in the things that I write about and uh, that I'm very interested in. Uh, the UK has given me the chance to, either through academic 
uh, studying and work, but also through just conversations with another nation, um, uh, with with another with another society, uh, to make my um, attempt to understand, for instance, where we are as a nation, where Romania is as a nation, when it comes to issues like the environment and human rights and all such such things that I've always been interested in. And so what I gained is some form of perspective, which I could check through conversation uh, here. And I think what I lost, um, I must say is really, um, if I have to reduce it to one thing, one thing that I miss, I think it's the snow. <laughs> you get it in Scotland. <laughs> Oh yes, but I'm right in the south in Dorset. You see, just the other the other end of the country. I'm afraid don't go to Scotland very often. <laughs> um, okay, thank you, uh, Vika. Do you want to go next? Uh, you know, I moved to London in 2012 for a master's degree, and uh, I still don't know what I lost because I was coming here for one year only, and uh, I wasn't planning to stay after that, let alone moving uh, my my son here for his education later. But little did I know at that point, so. I didn't have time to think about losing anything because everything was just uh, an amazing experience. Those 12 months in London in this cultural hub gave me so much joy and uh, uh, so much culture and knowledge and new friendships that uh, I didn't even have time to think about having lost anything. I think I only gained uh, a new life and it's a new experience and a new level. Amazing, very, very positive. Uh, Andrea? So, uh, because I have been living in Anglophone countries since I was five years old, I think the question is a bit different for me. And I wouldn't really know what I, what I would be like in another scenario in the sense that there is no before and after um, in my situation. Therefore, I would say that I've lost a certain sense of normalcy. However, I would say that it has made me adaptable. I've developed flexible thinking and it has made me a irrevocably um, modern person. I'm, I am a product of modernity and the current situation of our world and our country global child yeah simona well i think um, it wasn't really a choice for me to move to england i came here first to study i did a master uh, degree in uh, curating and then uh, i worked for almost eight years uh, as a project manager at the romanian cultural institute i was magda's colleague actually <laughs> so uh, what i gained in um, I don't know, in this profession, uh, a lot of experience that I didn't have before. And at the same time, I lost probably other opportunities to advance in my curating career profession, because it's far more difficult here to actually be able to curate exhibitions uh, for many reasons. I will not go into detail. But um, at the same time, I guess I gained um, love because I met my better half here and also poetry because I started to write poetry in, in England. And um, probably what I miss the most, uh, I miss the, um, my friends that I could meet easily and spontaneously in, in Romania. And I can't obviously do the same here now with my English friends or I don't know, international friends that live in London. So this is what I probably, yes, miss the most. Lovely. Um, Christina? So, um, similarly to Vika, I suppose, I, um, I came here thinking I would stay short term, but then I ended up staying much longer. Uh, I actually came here to publish my book. Uh, I was a blogger at the time in Romania, sharing my poetry and short stories on my blog. And then, uh, luckily, my uh, English editor discovered my blog and we ended up collaborating and we ended up publishing a book together. Um, at the time, I came thinking I would be here just enough to publish the book, but then life took over and I stayed. Um, and I'm, I'm not sorry, I, uh, I, don't regret, I don't regret anything. 
Uh, so this is the country where I became a published author. So it will always mean a lot to me. Um, I, I feel like I've gained a lot in terms of um, identity, if it makes sense. Uh, as my time here progressed and I integrated more and more here, uh, you kind of developed another identity uh, on a side of the one that you already had, the Romanian one, I should say. And uh, it's another culture that you that you know better and you learn so much from those values. And then it's a, it's a lot of value in comparing those two cultures and making the most of them. And then you grow as a person as much as, an, as a writer, I should say. Uh, in terms of what I've lost, um, I, I don't see it that way. I don't see that I've lost something, but I miss uh, more quality time with my friends, of course, and, and my family. But I, I make sure to go back to Romania as often as I can uh, and have more of my mom's food, <laughs> like Stella mentioned. Yes, thank you. The, the mom, mom's food is a theme in here. Um, Anda. Oh, um, my mom's food. <laughs> Um, happy birthday again, and um, um, do you want to answer the question as well? Yeah, thank you very much. First, I want to, to tell you about my English is under construction. Please forgive my big mistake. Um, it's not easy for me because we come, all the family three years ago to England uh, for my children to do the chance to uh, learn here, to meet the multi multiculturalism um, and to finish their, um, their study here. Um, like a parent, I understand that to grow up, to raise the children in the little country, little community, sometimes it's not enough in our time and we try the best for, uh, for them and we move uh, uh, just for this reason. Uh, and if it's about me, um, I, um, I overcame my fear because um, uh, all my uh, children encouraged me, we will be okay, we, we, <laughs> we just do, to, to try, if it's not okay, we can come back, yeah? Um, maybe, maybe the, the um, Orster uh, adaptation in all the family, uh, it, uh, it was uh, in my situation. It's not easy. I can imagine so. Um, thank you so much. Um, so uh, thank you all for um, for your very varied and um, honest um, responses. It's not... Um, an easy question. And then um, my next question open um, to you all is, um, how do you find living and in some cases writing into languages? So in my own case, um, I came here to the UK to um, study first and then I started working as a journalist. And so my, I find that my English, for instance, is more academic and more journalistic perhaps than um, my Romanian, uh, where I feel more creative um, in my writing. Um, and I was wondering to what extent, um, you know, you have come across differences in the way you express yourselves, in the way, um, in the thoughts you have um, in, in these different languages and whether, you know, you have uh, managed to um, develop um, a sense of humor in English as well, because um, um, there's um, uh, there's this saying that actually you only reach um, a degree of comfort in a second language once you actually manage to make other people laugh, which is not so um, so easy from from the beginning. Um, who shall we start with? I think um, I. I um... For us, those who were born in Soviet Union, we got used to this uh, commute between languages and cultures. Uh, I was first discovering the culture and languages and literature and, uh, and music at my music school back home, uh, studying in Russian. 
I fell in love with the uh, poetry of Pushkin, and then I fell in love with the uh, life stories of Tchaikovsky and Rimsky-Korsakov at this school, and then suddenly the country crushed and we rediscovered this joy of reading poetry by uh, Minulescu uh, by listening to uh, Enescu um, masterpieces and we fell in love with those and we commuted um, to more Romanian and we started writing in Romanian more and more and hopefully better. And then later on, when uh, uh, I joined the diplomatic mission, uh, I uh, I, I never studied English at school, nor did I study it at the university, but I met a lot of people who were speaking English at that job. So I commuted again and um, threw myself with a lot of enthusiasm in, uh, um, um, in adopting this new language and this culture and the books that they were recommending because I was extremely lucky to, uh, to work with great minds who inspired me and pushed me up. And this is how I ended up in this country by following those advices and, um, and those uh, uh, inspirational minds that worked with me. And when I moved here, I realized that everything that I knew before, I have to just forget because I have to become really cerebral here and uh, use the few words that I know in English in order to say a lot of things that my mind was trying to uh, to to convey as a message and uh, this became really mathematical and this became really a challenge and I was always trying to make sure that people understand that although I speak with an accent I can think without an accent <laughs> so again this um, this commute into a new way of talking and a new way of writing, I think it was um, another echo from what we are used to since we were teenagers and we were being thrown into another culture every 10 years. That's really interesting because um, I mean, we're of different generations and I guess I, I don't consider myself as bilingual in Romanian and Russian um, as your generation does. Um, but now we share the kind of the bilingualism in, uh, in English and Romanian. Um, who would like to go next? I was just wondering whether um, any of you have experienced the joy of this no man's land when you find yourself fluent in both languages and able to make your choice how to express yourself effectively, whether people experience this as a um, uh, as a sense of, uh, of, of of betrayal of one language towards the other, or on the country as a sense of um, uh, an extra layer of um, uh, of interestingness, I expect. You know, in my case, for instance, I uh, really it just simply doesn't make any difference uh, as well as I can express myself. I, I, can, I can I can as well as much as I have something interesting to say. Really, it doesn't matter. Um, not even not not only the language that I express it in, um, but it doesn't really matter the style that I express it in, whether it's lyrical, whether it's prose or essay or every I think really that every worthwhile idea attracts its own form of expression and you can't force it into another style at all. You can translate it in another language, but otherwise uh, it's, it, it comes with its own perfectly deliverable shape. So that's why I think it doesn't really matter whether it's English or Romanian or Chinese or whatever uh, you know you 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 speak as long as what you have to say is worthwhile and it's not a waste of time. So maybe I should not carry on speaking. <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> um, what do you think? So if I may, if I may say, I quite agree with you, Anna. Uh, on those lines, um, for me, I I found the commute between languages quite easy, I suppose, uh, because I was a multilingual child. I speak five languages and I've learned most of them as a, as a child or teenager. Uh, for those reasons, I suppose, I um, started writing, writing in English from the very beginning. So even when I was still in Romania and I was a blogger, I was writing only in English, which of course, some people find quite unusual, I suppose. And, um, 
that is the reason why my editor could actually read my poems and um, contact me and we ended up publishing the book. Um, after, after that, I suppose um, there, was, there was a sense of uh, improving the language while being here and um, learning how to use the language more and more to express deeper ideas and deeper emotion. Um, I guess this comes with time. And for me, I only find value in using various languages. And I always saw language as a tool, as much as I love Romanian, absolutely, I love Romanian. But for some reason, I find writing poetry much more easily in English. I don't have a logical explanation for that, as much as I would like to. <clears throat> but this is how it comes to me very naturally in English. Uh, and as much as I love Romanian, like I said, I think language is a tool and you can use whatever language you want to express uh, specific ideas and thoughts and emotions better suited for that language. I, for instance, use sometimes French or Italian and I often get a word that I need in a moment just in a certain language rather than the language that I need because there's a word that explains it much better in another language. It's hard to explain, but anyway, this is my, uh, this is my case. You're very lucky if, if, you're, if you find it so easy to adapt from one language to another, it's amazing. Um, I was curious, Andrea, um, what your experience was, because um, to you, maybe English is more of a native tongue than Romanian is, actually. First of all, I feel quite privileged to have access to an additional canon as opposed to my English language peers. It almost feels like exclusive access. I started reading Romanian novels and poetry when I was a teenager. And it, I think it definitely coincided with my desire to be a writer, actually. Um, but to answer your question, I would say that in equal measure to my identity problem, or lack thereof, I suppose, um, it comes very organically to me. I have found myself beginning a poem in Romanian and ending it in English and ending up translating it entirely in English. So that definitely works, I would say. Amazing. Um, so who else hasn't spoken yet? Um, Anda? Um, I, I can just compare with uh, Russia languages because I uh, grow up with Russia and um, it's not about English yet, yeah. Uh, but I, I understand uh, one thing, one important thing. Uh, if you dream, and your dream is the Romanian languages, this is your languages. I never in my dream um, spoke in Russia. Why? Because it's not my ident I, I identity. Yeah? Um, yesterday, Matej Vishniak uh, say some um, about um, his identity and um, said mm. my identity is Romanian language. Yeah? Uh, Matej Vishniak uh, speak uh, on French very good and English too. Yeah, But uh, we, we know uh, tell about um, our languages, um, what we feel uh, more, more deeper, more our, yeah. Thank you. Um, and we have Simona. Yes, well, <laughs> I started writing poetry in Romanian, actually, and quite recently that happened in 2017. But before that, I used to write um, art reviews, exhibition reviews. So I wrote both in Romanian and English. And then at the Romanian Cultural Institute, I had to use both languages most of the time actually writing and spoken language as well and um, I have a quite I don't know complex relationship with English because I'm not as fluent as I would like to be and not as nuanced as I would like to be but this gives me an opportunity I guess to learn more about language in general because I check up uh, words, their meanings, their synonyms or uses in different contexts. And it's a learning learning process that somehow is enriching 
And I feel sometimes frustrated because not wanting actually to improve my English. I don't read in Romanian as much as I used to. And it's in terms of productivity, I guess I'm slower and also in reading and also in writing. So that's frustrating. But as you said, Paula, actually, I felt more creative in Romanian. However, once I actually motivated myself to write more in English, then I started somehow to, you know, gain, <laughs> gain some <laughs> yeah, power, some strength. And uh, I actually do now uh, this, I have this kind of constant, I move constantly between the languages sometimes. And I made a joke that I use Google Translate to translate myself and never with the same results because, you know, if I check, sometimes I check Romanian words, you know, translated into English because they give more meanings actually than a Romanian dictionary. And that then that's actually a, I don't know, a strange process that, you know, I have to in order to look for, I don't know, multifaceted kind of meanings of a certain word. And Romanian seems for some reason, or maybe dictionaries are not uh, as comprehensive as, as English online dictionaries, at least. So I don't know, it's a, it's a complex relationship, but I hope I will be able to, I don't know, write more in English. That's my aim anyway. <laughs> yes, write really? poetry literature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really interesting. Yes, I, I find myself using the dictionary um, on a day to day basis in both languages now, because once you migrate, you actually need to work on your native tongue as well. It becomes That's an true. effort in itself. Um, Stella? Yes, um, I think, well, I am more comfortable with English and I guess it's because of something similar to what Vika touched upon earlier, the fact that we have a problematic relationship with our mother tongue. We were told that we spoke Romanian, uh, that our language was Moldovan, not Romanian, and um, we have a problematic history, a complex history, identity, language. And so when I moved to the UK, in my rush to um, assimilate uh, the English language, I kind of lost the nuances of the Romanian language and um, it became easier for me to write in English. And as Anda mentioned dreams, I actually remember that even though I still used to write in Romanian and my diaries were in Romanian, seven years after I moved to the UK, I first, I had my first dream in English. And that, it almost like a switch um, in my subconscious, um, it start, suddenly started to become a lot easier. It came a lot easier to me to write in English. And um, um, yes, you were uh, talking earlier about um, wh what makes us, uh, what changes do we see um, in talking uh, English. And I would like to say that moving to the UK actually made me more assertive um, and it made me more comfortable in, in um, expressing who I am and writing what I hold close to my heart. And that um, you see in Bessarabian Nights, in, in the latest book and in my poetry. And that, like I said, it comes a lot easier through English. That's really interesting that you've become more assertive um, um, when, when you moved here. So to um, the viewers who don't, um, who didn't understand perhaps um, the makeup of this, um, um, of this conversation and of this group, um, so Stella and uh, Vika and I are from the Republic of Moldova and everyone else is from Romania. So we have a mix and match um, uh, of um, different kind of historical contexts with which uh, we've grown up. Um, Stella, I would like to ask you to read um, a short extract from um, your latest novel. So um, my latest novel is called Set in Stone. And it's a historical fiction novel, similar to Bessarabian. And I find that in my prose, I have the same kind of themes reoccurring. And that's it's uh, female emancipation, women right, women's rights. It's uh, the role, the conflict of religion versus spirituality, uh, and the patriarchal mentality, a patriarchal country. And so. 
the extract that I'm going to read now, or previously in the previous chapter, right, I probably should say something about the book. It's um, set in uh, medieval Romania, and it's a book about two young women from opposing backgrounds who fall in love with each other, defying their family, the law, and the church. So in the previous chapter, we see the village herbalist, mm. people called her a witch, Rosalia, saving this young woman called Mira from near drowning in a frozen lake. So in this extract, we see Mira ready to go home after she um, had been looked after by Rosalia. Mira doesn't know how many days she's been in Rosalia's hut, but one morning she wakes up in no, with no pain. The heavy fog has lifted from her head, and if it wasn't for the ugly gap in her hand, she would have thought it was all about dream. She's getting ready to leave, and because Rosalia, who is busy crushing strips of bark with a stone, hasn't said anything, Mira decides to ask the question outright. Will I be able to make pots? It's the only thing I know what, how to do. It will take some time to get used to it. Get used to working the clay again or get used to being maimed and useless. The old woman is answering her questions by not answering them at all. Sorry about all the trouble and thank you for saving my life, she says and turns for the door. It's your father you should thank. He has certainly learned from his mistakes. How's that? So the meadows were awash with wild ponies that day, their raw, royal red spilling whichever way you looked. I was in the midst of a special ride, but I couldn't focus on it because your mother's cries filled the air. I turned up on your doorstep with a bunch of herbs to help her get through it quicker, but your father wouldn't let me. He said, Lord Jesus Christ would soothe and protect his wife. Rosalia had finished crush crushing the bark and is scooping the coarse flour into a pot. Please don't judge your father too harshly. He loved your mother. It's just that he prayed for a miracle instead of accepting my help. You know what people think of me. He should have asked my mother and let her decide. The words catch in Mira's throat. Did you know her? What was she like? You have her looks, same green eyes, green colored hair, even the wee mole above your lips. And you have her fire too. I used to meet her in the woods often when she gathered pine wood for your father's kiln. Tiny yet feisty she was. Her bargaining with Boyer Constantine for the price of wood was legendary. Without her, your father wouldn't be the potter he is today. And that's the point that I make in the book that very often throughout history, women have been in, sh in the shadow of men and a lot of um, important things and groundbreaking work that women have done, um, have not, they have not received cred credit for it. They have been robbed of recognition. Thank you so much, Stella. Um, how, um, I'll, I'll just ask you one question. How do you uh, come up with, with the ideas for your book? So your first, your debut novel focused on um, sex trafficking. Um, and this one is set in medieval Romania. Um, how, how did the ideas come about? Well, even though they are set in two different time periods, they actually address the same kind of issues, as I mentioned earlier. It's the um, female emancipation and women's rights um, and, and religion versus spirituality, which is huge in my work. And especially with Set in Stone, the medieval um, book, it's, um, I wanted to explore the area uh, or the time in history when women were taken to the stake, where they burned at the stake for their wisdom, because essentially they were early scientists, they worked with herbs, and they were punished for it. So for me, that was fascinating. I wanted to delve into it and try and explore it. Thank you so much. We're going to go to um, Simona Nastak now. Yes, okay. Uh, if I may, I will read two because they are very short. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Prayer. The bare feet walk in your footsteps on salt, water, and fire. Lianas and bats spring out of my thigh. Breasts burst with rootstocks, fish, and honey. Three hearts are crossing your path. Let's take our offspring to kindergarten, feed them stories, tulip bulbs. The battlefield will blossom polychrome like a painting by Van Gogh. Father, Give us our daily bread, 
the bacteria of happiness, and forgive us our trespasses. Words last longer than flesh. And the second, untitled. I have a white simple shirt with no pockets, bu buttons, embroidery, etc. Nothing at all. Has a spare button inside out. It's useless. A poem. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really um, interested in how you came to write poetry because you said you started writing poetry in the UK, but you yes. wrote in Romanian. Yes. How how did it all happen? How did you move from our curation to poetry writing and how did the two communicate in your life? Well, it happened quite spontaneously and so it wasn't planned in any way and I wasn't really reading poetry. I was organizing poetry events though at the Romanian Cultural Institute. So therefore, of course, I met poets and I read their poetry at least. And um, it happened like uh, on the move, on the bus, going to work, really. And my first poem was written in English. So it came naturally to me in English. But uh, then I continued and in both languages and I decided to publish in, in Romanian. So I don't know, I guess it was I my kind of poetic practice, writing practice is very much influenced by my visual art background and education. And um, I used to write art reviews where obviously there is a kind of challenge to always to vividly describe an artwork. And then I guess somehow that kind of language uh, made its uh, way to, to my poetry, to my other type of writing. Uh, but I don't know, I never actually dreamed of becoming a poet, never thought I will be one. So it happened, uh, as I said, uh, like by chance and uh, I, I like it and I want to explore it more so I published my my first book in Romanian and I'm working on um, I don't know a chapbook let's say to, to be published in English yeah. Amazing. what a serendipity you know um, um, we're gonna go to Vika now I will read you a few lines from my um, book of poetry in English that is on the way and hopefully one day when I find a better balance between commuting between work and, uh, and art, I will find time to, to finally um, make it happen. <clears throat> Statistics lesson. Vanished inside my own desert overwhelmed by the dummy variables of my postponed dates, failing to remember the standard deviation of my decisions, hidden somewhere under or above precisions, caught in the middle of several admitted uncommitted errors, shifted and backspaced by the mean of means, I am more than an equation and less than a result. The more I fit into the right interval, the less I see myself in my own mirrors. I am on my own, completely, undoubtedly, undeniably alone, controlling for all other variables. Forecast. I bought a pair of Wellingtons, waiting for the rain season to start. And I put them on and I kept waiting and waiting and waiting. One week of hope, one month of recline, before I took them back to get reimbursed for my waiting time. If I knew I could find my way to your soul's postcode, I could have kept living in a bona fide vicinity of my expectations that I never met for several seconds more. In fact, I don't need any shoes when it is so cold. I'm able to go barefoot when it is so wet. If I only could find my way to this indefinite proximity that is just several text messages away to this bona fide vicinity, which I never saw, even though I have already searched the eternity. Thank you, Vika. Um, I'm really curious. So you're, I think you're the only one here who also writes um, lyrics for music. And I was wondering uh, whether you could take us through your process and what it actually means to write 
lyrics for another musician, what it means to write lyrics for yourself as a singer songwriter. Um, how does it happen and how does it differ from um, your poetry writing? It's a complex subject. We cannot uh, talk about this in just several seconds. Um, to bring justice to this subject and to speak in the defense of uh, songwriters, it is much more difficult to write for songs. Uh, although at some point, if you look at the lyrics that are made for songs, you would think that they are not as good as the ones that are made for books. Uh, and because I did both, I wrote poetry for my books of poetry before, and I worked with artists to create songs that would match the exact length of the line, the music line, that would only have that number of words and uh, that rhythm that is required. I feel it is much more complicated and it's much more mathematical. Uh, you cannot add uh, too many words when the track is only that long and uh, you have in the end uh, you have to be able to look at this and have a perspective and this has to make sense it has to be about something you have to convey a message and uh, it's it's really complex um, it, it depends who is singing you have to uh, know the artist you have to know what they would like to think to to sing about um, it's um, it's always um, uh, a process of cutting and amending and chopping uh, the lyrics that first looked like uh, a poem. Uh, you just transform them and you make them really geometrical in order for them to fit the music track, but to still make sense. And uh, you you have not to be selfish. The writer who writes for songs doesn't have to be selfish because you have to be um, able to understand that you chop your words and you amend them for a greater good, for, for something that will be a, an end uh, project, an end product, the song that everyone will listen to and uh, will feel the magic that only comes from this um, collaboration that you have between the, the songwriter, the composer and the artist. So it's, it's really complex. We'll have to have another, uh, another talk about that. <laughs> I think you've explained it quite well, actually. Um, I can see a guitar in your um, in your background. Uh, how often do you do you play it? Given that you have a full time job. <laughs> well, I I wish I could play more often, but um, I also have a piano, and it's uh, it's well hidden so that I don't see it too much, and I, I have more time to focus on what uh, the the financial capital is not allowing us to be too artistic. You, you're always in a survival mood here, and um, I wish we could have more time to to create more art and to be able to build bridges between our cultures and people from those countries and this country. But uh, uh, we have what we have and... Uh, and uh, we do our best with it. We, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Andrea, would you be so kind to, um, to read? Um, if, if you could read one, um, one text rather than two, that would be um, very helpful because I think we're running um, out of time. So I usually don't write social poetry. I consider myself more of a lyric poet, but this is a poem that I wrote with a sense of compassion for children who are bullied for where they come from and for the child I once was. Romanian has become the day's Dadaist crack. Your ears, the single Romanian pair in the room have grown enormous Knowing as Buddha and rooted as Banyans, they have a better acoustic system than Carnegie Hall. And the final chimes of derision or shame hit against your timpani like droplets of rain on the windshield in traffic as mama drives you home from school. Now, whenever someone asks where you're from, your own eyes are factory glazed with a protective layer of irony. It makes for a charming, exotic effect, someplace between Latin and Slavic, these two prudent agate stones 
with which you throw suspicious glances like arrows of love. But in the evening, after you've returned to your counterfeit home, you lie in the dark and watch Nadia's perfect 10 on YouTube, granulated by pixels and time, the golden bird still lovely after its desecration. Thank you so much. Um, so you have a really interesting um, life story. So you've left Romania quite early, you've lived in the US, you studied in the UK, and now during the, uh, the lockdown, you are in Romania, right? Yes, um, that's right. Yeah, what do all of these countries um, mean to you? And where do you see yourself um, in the future, um, if um, anywhere in particular or everywhere um, at different stages? I think it's it's difficult to say, to be honest. Um, I do feel replenished being home, being here, being uh, with my roots, as they say, which is why the image of the banyan tree with its huge roots comes up in the poem partially. Um, ideally, I, I think that I would have a difficult time being set in stone forever someplace. Uh, but I suppose one has to be pragmatic and see what what will be the best possibility. However, um, having lived in so many places, I am a big believer in destiny, which I think also maybe has contributed to my formation as a poet. Very interesting. Um, and you've recently translated the short stories um, of either Sirbu and the poetry of uh, Trajan Koshavei. I was wondering how that experience was for you, because you said that for you Romanian also means um, having an access to a canon that um, your American and British friends didn't really um, have access to. So um, yeah, I was just wondering how that experience was for you and what um, translating um, kind of meant um, for you. So it was an amazing experience. It really riled up my enthusiasm and I, I became so involved that I would recommend translation as a form of developing your own writing to any, any poet who is able to do so. Particularly poetry, I would say, after all fiction is, is a bit more difficult. How did you choose these two authors in particular? Um, through a simple coincidence, so I initially befriended my uh, co-translator, Adam J. Sorkin, who is a great translator of Romanian poetry. Um, and we all only happened to realize that we had both translated Kosove. And then uh, Sirbu sort of came into my life again through um, happenstance, I suppose, a, a publisher was interested again through through mutual friends. But I'm, I'm very glad that fate brought both of these authors to me. Um, okay, thank you so much. We're gonna go to Ioana now. Um, would you um, be so kind to read us um, a poem or an extract of a novel? I think you were reading a poem today, I'm right? I'm gonna go for a, for a poem because it's shorter and it doesn't require other context that makes up from a prose wood. Um, and also because it connects with uh, Simona's, one of Simona's poems. Um, it's also a prayer. It's a prayer for sea crossing migrants uh, across the Mediterranean. <clears throat> for the rough edges of the wind where Arctic turns accustomed to the longest trajectories lose want. For ghostly tides so gently depositing a body onto the dry hands of this earth. For the held breath of the moon, the land which broke, vicious, visceral, vandalized, and the foreign shore, barbed wire and tranquilized. For those whistles fitted into the side of a, of a safety jacket, now, now floating at the end of the string like bait for mortality. For the knee which surfaced for an entire hour, then the orange sea turtles inert in their hundreds carried further and further apart. For all the plankton brushing against eyelids and foot soles and the music miles away, melting into this darkness, above the contrails invisible in the night sky, the men with a camera waiting on the usual beach where currents oblige. For the child who trusted and the mother who hoped, for the men who had no other choice, may there be thought. Thank you so much. Um, so I was really curious about this uh, project that um, you started during the first lockdown. 
you cur yes. curated an international um, project exploring the state of isolation where 100 poets from 47 countries wrote several lines of poems in a kind of collective work. Mm -hmm. How did the idea come about and um, what surprised you and delighted you in the process of um, um, making it come together? Yes, um, maybe three really uh, uh, threads of thought came into this uh, project to start with. One was that I found myself reading a lot more poetry than I had before, uh, and also writing more poetry than I did before um, during the months of the, the beginning of the lockdown. Um, and uh, I was wondering why that was uh, really maybe in secular, in a secular world that we're living in, poetry is the closest that we have to, to prayer in a way. And the metaphor is something that it's more, you know, it can function both as a magnifying glass towards reality, but also a, a protective filter between us and reality. And um, the, this particular role of metaphor in a situation of crisis was interesting to explore for me. Um, and the other, the other thread that fed into creating this project was, I was just simply very curious how isolation or loneliness looks like uh, in other corners of, of the planet, because, you know, I find myself living in a beautiful place by the coast and I could go for walks, even if just once a day as we were allowed and have a garden and I was with my family. And um, so the lockdown was a bit of a, you know, busy holiday, let's say, call it that way. But for many people around the planet, this doesn't at all look like this. And in fact, one of the, one of the poets in, in uh, Airborne Particles uh, collective poem was describing to me in an email how it feels to live in Bombay, a city of 20 million people, where that is now completely, was completely deserted and um, you know, quiet, uh, how, how eerie that was, how strange that was. So that's what I really wanted. I wanted to explore, um, to see how isolation and loneliness may look uh, in, on five different continents, as many countries as possible, through the eyes of talented poets. Um, uh, and it took the, the shape of a renga poem. This is a Japanese traditional form of poetry of which we are more accustomed to the first stanza of it, which is a haiku. And the rest of it can continue indefinitely. I mean, there are generations and generations uh, of that can write the same renga poem. We had to stop at the hundred clearly, not go further on. Um, but it was great uh, to have all through the lockdown, the poem came back to me every morning, every day, and then I would send it on to another poem. So every morning I would have another image, six lines of, uh, of interpretation of this state we were all in from uh, uh, you know, anywhere from New York to Bombay to, uh, Cameroon to Romania and so on and so forth yeah such a lovely project mm -hmm. and such a great um, lockdown project as well yeah. um, so I was also curious um, about your political activity um, so you, you are a member of, of the Green Party in the UK and I was wondering whether you were as political when you were in Romania were you a member of a political party there and if not mm -hmm. how did it come mm -hmm. about? Yes, I know not of a political party, but I was always uh, leaning towards towards the left. Um, as you probably, or most of you probably know, it's kind of quite difficult to be um, to be uh, on the left side of politics in Eastern Europe. You, know, you can you can be accused of being a communist nostalgic at its worst or at its best. You are probably sort of associated with the wrong kind of political parties, which tend to be at least in Romania, the left wing party pretty corrupt um, and you don't want to have anything to do with them but of course there is always the conversation that it's never had there and uh, I would love to be able to um, to discover that it will take place sometime soon that the left-wing politics and socialism for the younger generation don't really mean communism anymore they mean human rights and they mean um, you know, the green movement environment, which has inbuilt in it equality and, and uh, equal sharing of resources and care, um, all these things. This, this, this is the sort of um, um, perspective that myself and, and many other people um, of our generation come from. Um, so yes, I joined the Green Party here and I've been voting with them pointlessly <laughs> for quite a while. I, I, I was quite, um, I'm quite very interested in been very active. I'm also a member of uh, Extinction Rebellion um, in Britain and um, 
I'm very interested in where this will, this is going to take us. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, I, I would argue that actually in Romania, um, left wing politics are gaining more ground now, but maybe, you know, that's just my social media bubble with like hundreds of young people um, who, um, yeah, are, are, are support, are like promoting a new kind of um, politics. Um, Anda, um, I'm not sure whether um, you want to read a poem or shall I just um, ask you the question? No, no. Um, I want to invite my daughter to read one poem because we don't have uh, so much time for my reading. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> it's a, the Hi. best. This is Alexander. Hi. Hi, Alexander. Um, I can't look at my hands. Often and often I avoid looking at my hands as if they do not belong to me. But to my mother, when she was preparing my bag to go out into the world, she was wrapping each object in small bags. She was stretching their folds, arranging their corners, and at the end she was smoothing them once more. She asked me if I, forgot, if I had forgotten my thick socks and the wool sweater that she had also knitted for me from other two teased ones, not to be called in the mountains. Next to it was waiting, wrapped in a bag of mats, the wool blanket received for arms at the funeral of Grandfather Mihai, and a brand new cauldron bought from the central market with two kilograms of spilled buckwheat. Not to be hungry, she told me. They do not have buckwheat there. She put them together and tied them with a string. She stretched their folds and arranged their corners, and she smoothed them once more. The last thing was the long nightgown, which she sewed for me before I left. Why you elapsed with dignity? She left it written with a pen on the inside of the nightgown. She joined me to the train station in one October morning. She stretched the creases of my blouse. She arranged its corners and smoothed it once more. Since then, I have been gone and further. My mother was the age I am now. Me, why can't I look at my hand? Thank you so much. Such a lovely moment. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Alexander. It was part of my new book, who will, uh, will appear in a few months, uh, on to Romanian um, uh, editor. Sweet. Um, so, Anda, you have kept a diary of your life in London since you moved here in 2017. That's also the year when you published your first poems. And in a recent entry or on your blog, you say um, that things that surprised you about the city at the beginning have now become ordinary. Um, how, what has writing meant um, to you getting adapted to life in a different city and a different country and a different language? Um, first, when I uh, I um, I come, I don't have um, no expectation. I just want to to live, to observe, to write about all is new, all is different. All the people ask me, um, uh, how is the school? How is new? What is the different here? And uh, this is, uh, is the reason why I uh, start to, to keep this diary um, all the month, uh, because for myself first, I understand that uh, it's um, this multicultural uh, society uh, mean to accept all the different, uh, not to say, oh, it's a stranger people. Why stranger? Because it's different. Uh, if the people have another uh, another opinion, another behavior, uh, sometimes we compare with our behavior, with our opinion. And I understand it's not about true or not true. It's about uh, different and we need to accept uh, that. Um, all the people ask me about why on my blog uh, I all the time uh, write the, just the good things about uh, UK because I mean just just a, a good things. Uh, this was my my uh, it, it was my gift uh, from uh, England to me to Romanian girl who come here and start again at 40 years old. Yeah, uh, and um, I understand I understand um, uh, how much people who don't live uh, never their country uh, can't understand and accept a different uh, life of a style of life. Uh, I try uh, on this blog to explain it's normal to be different. It's normal to have different 
uh, tradition, uh, to understand different things, to have different decisions. Uh, this is how uh, first I learned, and I try to, to translate um, in my blog to, to, to the people who, who stay in Moldova, especially, but they have a lot of, uh, a lot of people from Romania who read my, my blog. Thank you so much. Um, and the final um, reading tonight will be from uh, Christina Mureshan. Thank you. Um, I'll be reading a poem called um, Verse, Color and Sound. Uh, it was published in a poetry anthology here in the UK. And just for a bit of context, it was inspired by uh, an experience I had during an event at the Romanian Cultural Institute in London. I think about inspiration and its source and how it takes me by surprise. Like the time I was listening to a live guitar piece by a composer I knew nothing about, too powerful and unusual to analyze. So I close my eyes and listen in deep silence and a thought comes to me like a gentle wave. It says this music sounds like a Salvador Dali's painting. It makes me smile in its weirdness only to find out later that Dali and the composer had been friends. I tried to understand where that thought came from. So I think about Carl Jung's archetypes and the unconscious and about Einstein who was simply playing in the garden when he discovered the theory of relativity. I know there is a link between my verse, Dali's colors and the musician's notes. Maybe they are golden dust from a cosmic mandala that my brain is too small to grasp. So I settle for gratitude. Thank you so much. Um, so you said earlier that, um, that you grew up um, multilingual in like five languages. Can you talk a bit more uh, about that and then about your move to the UK and what, what determined it? Um, and Sure. Uh, well, I just learned, uh, I learned the languages in school and I really loved languages. So I, I kind of uh, took it quite easily. I learned, I learned French and uh, Italian and Spanish, of course, English. Um, so I always like to say that my brain became a bit fluid, so to speak, because of that, because I was really fascinated by languages and easily flowing from one to another. Um, later on, uh, when I moved to the UK, I think I mentioned earlier, it was just a serendipitous uh, moment when uh, I was a blogger and uh, my English editor uh, discovered my blog and he contacted me later on uh, and suggested we should collaborate and publish a book together. So uh, I came for that purpose really uh, it was uh, it was a special opportunity, I thought at the time, and I still think so. Uh, so we managed to publish the book uh, about a year later. It took a bit longer than I had thought at the time. Uh, it was a lot of work, uh, but I was uh, very happy that we finalized the project. What, what's next? Um, what are you working on at the moment? Well, of course, poetry will always be a part of my writing and I'm always writing new poems. Uh, I'm not sure if the next uh, project will be another poetry book. I've started um, playing along with playing with uh, prose a bit more and I've started writing a novella, uh, which I had been uh, uh, thinking about for quite a few years now, but I'm taking my time. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, I find it much easier to write poetry in English, but when it comes to prose, uh, it's not as easy. It takes a bit more time and uh, more structure. And so I'm taking my time to uh, get something really good quality out of that. Uh, and of course, uh, I'm also writing book reviews sometimes, uh, which I find really a good opportunity to, uh, of course, read more, explore, uh, critical thinking and uh, yes, uh, it was a very interesting experience overall. Thank you so much everyone um, for your thoughts and um, um, and your texts um, and readings today. I really enjoyed uh, meeting all of you um, and I hope our viewers uh, have enjoyed it too. 
um, I wish everyone um, a lovely night and a lovely rest of the week. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.